All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to chapter 22. I just realized my hair is a disaster. Hard to find a... Okay, well, there's no barbers open right now. But the sport clips of Simi Valley claims that they're open. I'm guessing they have outdoor hairstyling or something like that. That would be an experience. Never had my hair cut outdoors. Um, but yeah. All right. So we're going to get started. Chapter 22 is metabolism. Let's go ahead and check that out here. And metabolism is something that is very personal to many people because food is personal. People have different views on what they consider to be the proper dietary regimen for them. And I know that there's even genetic tests that can determine based on your background, um, what exactly is the right balance of macronutrients for you. And people have, have also ethical and social reasons for the foods that they eat. So what this is, is that metabolism is centered around food intake. And by the way, metabolism means the sum of all chemical reactions that happen in a cell. So food intake is the basis of metabolism. And it is going to center around a part of the brain that we call the hypothalamus going to draw a boxing gloves here. So the hypothalamus, what I say is this region here. And there's two parts or two sections of the brain that govern food intake. And one is called the feeding center. And the feeding center is based on tonic control. And it is going to center around the appetite. So this is the part that tells you it's time to eat. You get hungry. And of course, as we'll talk about, is this is based on signals from other parts um, of the body. And the next is going to be the satiety center. And this is also based on chemical signals. And this is going to determine fullness. So we have different sections in the hypothalamus. One is going to detect when you're hungry. One is going to detect when you are full. Now, what are the factors that, it's, that the, the term is satiety? And the first is going to be the stomach. And I'm, I'm kind of bummed that we, that we weren't able to talk about the, the stomach much. Okay, that's not really how a stomach looks. But you know what? Doesn't look too much different from that. Ish. All right, so the stomach is going to secrete a hormone called ghrelin. Um, one thing about the di digestive system is it is the site of what's called the enteric nervous system, it has about 25% of the neurons that the brain has, which means that it is actually a self-regulating self system that does not necessarily need outside influence. Just shows you how important the, the digestive system is to survival. If you can't digest food, it's going to be a very uh, difficult um, existence. In fact, it will not be very long. So ghrelin, think of growling, your stomach growling. The greater ghrelin secretion, so the greater the concentration of ghrelin, the greater the appetite. I guess that's not really it. You know, I don't like that term. We're going to go with hunger. The greater the hunger. Ghrelin, stomach growling, the greater the ghrelin, the greater the hunger. And of course, this is going to feed back to the feeding center of the hypothalamus. Next, we are going to have a system called insulin. So insulin is a very important hormone that's going to govern what we call the fed system of um, metabolism. So this is the pancreas-ish, and it's going to be cells called beta cells. And beta cells are going to secrete a hormone called insulin as well as measure its levels. So these are called beta cells, and they secrete insulin. Um, so what, so what, what this is going to be is the lower insulin levels are, then the greater 
the hunger. Now, that makes sense because insulin is a hormone that is secreted in the presence of blood like glucose. Uh, correction, the, the beta cells also detect the concentration of blood glucose and adjust secretion of insulin accordingly. So when insulin is low, that means that glucose is not present in sufficient quantities in the blood and thus the person needs to eat. When insulin levels are high, that means the person is fed. That means that glucose is coursing in the bloodstream and hunger goes down. So this also is involved in the feeding center of the, the hypothalamus. It has receptors for these molecules just like any other type of cell communication. And the last one is going to be interesting and this information is a little bit outdated, but I think the textbook also was a little bit too enthusiastic with some of their, 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 their data too, because this is still a rapidly developing field. But it's something called leptin. So I do ask you to re refer to this instead of the book. So leptin is a, is a hormone secreted by adipose cells or fat cells. Um, okay, adipose cells today will be dark green. Secreted by adipose cells. Um, leptin is a bit interesting, and we'll talk about that soon. But the greater, actually, let me not use pink. Stick with our dark green theme. So the greater the leptin, then the lower hunger. And of course, the inverse is also true. The greater the, the, the levels of leptin, the lower the hunger. Inverse is true. Lower concentrations of leptin, higher amounts of hunger. And I'll go ahead and draw arrows here. Higher insulin, lower hunger. And for the stomach, it would be lower ghrelin, lower ghrelin, lower hunger. So these are three signals that bind with receptors on the, the hypothalamus and ultimately detect whether or not the person should, should feel hungry or full. Now leptin is an interesting one and it's one of the hormones that's, that's implicated with obesity. So I'm gonna draw here a snapshot of the hypothalamus and the same is also true with insulin too. I'm just going to use leptin as an example. This is going to be leptin and hunger control. So we talked about a process back in chapter six, I believe, called down regulation, which is where if there's too much concentration of a signaling molecule, that means there's going to be too much of an effect within the cell the only way the cell can counter it is to take away receptors on the surface. So let's say that in a normal system, we're gonna have, I'll just say, um, keep it simple, we'll have four receptors. And in the blood, we are going to have X concentration of leptin. I'll just say to keep it simple, we're gonna have two leptin molecules. Now, of course, I'm really understating this, but it's a teaching purpose. So let's say that, that to maintain, to main, maintain homeostasis, homeostasis, we need two leptin, two leptin molecules per hour. I don't know, this is just, just, just arbitrary. So what happens is that leptin is going to diffuse out and bind with the receptors. Great, so we have a physiological response. Then we are going to have a normal response. We are going to have a normal response to leptin. Now, here's what's interesting. Secretion of leptin is based on number of adipose cells. Once again, secretion of leptin is based on number of adipose cells. Now, why is that significant? That means that the more 
more adipose cells someone has, the more leptin is secreted. Now, leptin is in response to, um, to food intake, specifically fats. What's going to happen is that someone, someone that is obese, they're going to have much more leptin in their, in their blood. So now let's, let's say that we are going to have now four leptin molecules per hour. Four leptin molecules per hour. What's going to happen now is that this extra leptin is going to saturate the receptors. <clears throat> we are instead going to have a supraphysiological response, meaning you're going to have excessive response happening in the cell. Now, the cell doesn't, doesn't like this. So it, is, so it is going to take away receptors to maintain the same desired response of two, 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 uh, two leptin molecules per hour. So what's gonna happen here is that you're gonna have all this, all this leptin, oops, and it's going to be continually saturating the cells and everything's going to be, to be good. You're still gonna have your two per hour. All right. So this will be a way to maintain your two leptin molecules per hour. And as I said, this is completely arbitrary. This is all fine and good. As long as there's excessive amounts of leptin in the, in the bloodstream. We call that leptin controls hunger. Now let's say the person decides that they want to eat less fat and diet. They want to lose weight. Well, here comes the problem. Now there's going to be less leptin in the blood, but now there's also less leptin receptors. So now instead we are going to have, I'll just say, uh, to keep things simple, I'll just erase this one too. So now what's gonna happen is that we are going to have only one leptin binding per hour. <clears throat> And that's a problem because now we have, I don't know the exact term, but it's, it's, it's going to be a less than desired response. So now we have a very bad situation here because the body wants, wants homeostatic levels of two leptin molecules per hour. <clears throat> Because of the excessive leptin concentration, it had four, four leptins binding per hour, which gave us a super physiological response. Mm -hmm. And to fix that, it down-regulated the receptors in order to have returned to a normal response. Well, now the problem is, is, is now that we still have the receptors down-regulated, but now we have less leptin molecules, and the response is now is that we're only going to have one leptin per hour. We're getting a less than desired response. So what's going to happen here is that now that the, the person has returned to normal levels of leptin, they don't have the adequate number of receptors. And now we are, are going to have the response still of hunger. And this explains or one reason why dieting is so hard especially for people that are very obese. And that's because even if they cut calories to, a, to an amount that's still an impressive amount, they're, they're, they're gonna feel like they're starving, that they have to eat when really the opposite is true. It's just because of the process of uh, downregulation, you have to maintain that excessive amount of leptin in the, in the bloodstream to receive a normal response. And if you don't have that excessive amount of leptin in the, in the blood, you are gonna have a response that's less than, than desired. And, and the hypothalamus is going to send out signals that you're still hungry. And of course, the problem is the opposite if you are very thin. Because then, then what happens 
is the receptors upregulate to maximally bind with the, with the low levels of, 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 of leptin presence. So in the case of people that are extremely thin, is that they're actually going to feel fuller faster. So the way this uh, the system is designed, thanks to down and up regulation, is, is, is people who, who are underweight, <clears throat> they find it very hard to gain weight. People that are overweight find it hard to lose weight. Now, of course, <clears throat> if you can just, just bear with the discomfort for about a week, the amount of receptors will up, up regulate back to normal and you will no longer feel nearly as hungry. But it's that week of suffering in between. One thing that I know the Atkins diet, also known now as keto, tends to do is by, um, by, by having a diet that's higher in fat, not higher in calories, it's higher in fat, is you're supposed to maintain more proper leptin levels, which helps the person to not feel nearly as hungry when they are cutting calories. All right, so now we are going to talk about energy balance in the body. Go ahead and clear this out. Energy balance in the body. And this is more like, what does the body do with the food that you eat? Energy balance. So I'm just gonna say, again, we're gonna keep it simple. Person ingests 100 calories. It's actually more KCAL. What's going to happen is that about 50% is going to be lost as heat. That's because the human body, the process of energy conversion is not 100% efficient. And a byproduct of energy conversion is heat. For example, if you drive your car, when you open the hood, you'll find that it's very hot. And why is that? Because lots of the energy burned <clears throat> in the form of gasoline, lots of that burn is going to be lost as heat. Really, internal combustion engines are about 35% efficient. So the human body being 50% efficient is actually better. This is actually desired though. It helps us maintain a normal internal body temperature. Losing energy as heat is actually very desired by the body or else we'd be in big trouble. Um, yes, that's also why if you're, if you aren't, aren't eating as much as you should, you might feel very cold. Now, the rest of it is going to be used as work. Meaning, it's actually going to be used to do things in the body. One of those things is going to be transport. And this comes in the form of um, active transport. Active transport. And also it's going to be, um, yeah, actually just, just active transport. I don't know why I, I did that. So it's going to be the form of pumps Um, symporters, slash antiporters, as well as bulk transport. Such as phagocytosis, etc. Actually, I think most of the energy in our body is used for, for, for transport especially sodium potassium pumps, those take up a lot of energy. Next is going to be mechanical, mechanical movement. And this is in the form of muscle contraction. Now, not nearly as much as you might think. I did a, a uh, I volunteered for a study where I had to go into a metabolic chamber and all there was was a, a like hospital room. There was a bed, a TV, one of those crummy hospital TVs, uh, a toilet, of course, and a treadmill. 
this treadmill incline, the 30% incline. So I was like, you know, it's party time. So I set the treadmill to 30% and I'm going at it like a wild animal on that stupid thing for two and a half hours. I burned about 700 calories after doing all that work. So when you do cardio, for example, even if you have a monster workout, depending on your, your body weight, then it's not going to burn as many calories as you think. Now, of course, there's lots of other benefits to exercise is, for example, building muscle mass. For every pound of muscle that you gain, you burn five more calories an hour. Of course, that's, that's, that's uh, good or bad, depending it or not if there's, if there's plenty of food available. And also, you continue to, to burn calories after the exercise, too. So not just, just when you're exercising, but after the, but after the exercise, too. And plus, of course, it keeps, keeps up your muscle tone and things like that. But just don't, don't think that. Uh, I know that some people think, oh, I ate like um, crap yesterday. I better go on the treadmill for an hour and burn it off. Uh, you won't burn it off. You might, you might put a small tent in it. But really, it's, you are, it's not like you're, you're going to reverse 2,000 calories of damage. I mean, that's just, sorry, 2,000 extra calories. It just... It just is part of part of life. Just enjoy it and and uh, and and move on. Find the best ways just to eat, 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 eat healthy in general. And a couple of days of quote unquote splurging is not going to upset anything. Now that all you can eat buffets are being phased out, that kind of helps things a bit because my family adores the all you can eat buffet. All right, sorry to wax poetic on you. Last is chemical. And this is going to be anabolic, meaning to build, and catabolic, meaning to break down, enzymatic reactions. Enzymes catalyze chemical reactions, and basically it either results in a compound being made more complex, such as, as, as glucose monomers being bound to form uh, uh, glycogen, or catabolic reactions where, where, where glycogen is broken down to glucose, just to give you an example. All right, next we're going to talk about fed state and fasting state metabolism. All right, everyone, well, welcome back. We're on to our next part where we'll be talking about metabolism. And metabolism is an interesting word because it seems to be used to define whether or not you're going to gain weight or lose weight. And really, the actual meaning of that is a little bit more complex than that. It's the sum of all chemical reactions in the body. And really, uh, what someone means by slow and fast metabolism is how fast your calories are burned, when really there's not a whole lot of genetic variation on how your cells use energy. But from my understanding is there is genetic variation in how efficient your body is at converting energy. So there are some people that convert more energy to heat than to actually chemical energy. And those people have a quote unquote faster metabolism. But as I said, variation is really not that much. It really has to do with, with things that are external factors like appetite and perspectives toward, toward food, anxiety, so on and so forth. And really, weight gain is the kind of thing that, is, that, that creeps up on people. It's, and we tend to say things like, well, I'm not eating that much, or, or this is low-fat ice cream, so I can have the entire pint. So it's really just a lot of uh, a lot more psychological than it is physiological. All right. Um, so next up, we're going to be talking about two types of metabolism: fed state and fasting state. It's very important that we understand these. So fed state occurs in the time period. 
where food is ingested. So we'll go ahead and say a couple of hours. Now, like everything else that happens in the body, it's governed by hormones. And the hormone that it's, it's governed in is going to be insulin. And insulin is a very anabolic hormone. So it's insulin driven. And the process of fixed state metabolism is going to be one of anabolism. So it is a very anabolic um, state. Now, why is that? That is because more complex molecules are formed via a process called dehydration synthesis. Dehydration means to remove water. Synthesis means to make or to combine. So what happens is that in fed state metabolism, just to give you an example, is your body's going to work very hard to convert your complex molecules to a simple sugar called glucose. It is the simplest building block of a carbohydrate. What's going to happen is that thanks to dehydration synthesis, is that the glucose, if it is not used by your cells, is going to be converted to a more complex molecule called glycogen. For those of you that are my age or older, you may re remember that athletes were encouraged uh, to do something called carb loading. The idea behind that was to maximize liver glycogen levels so they can be converted during a long run. When really, although the idea behind that is sound, it is um, the liver cannot hold nearly as much glycogen as maybe we tend to think. So insulin is a very, very anabolic hormone. It is, it is, it is going to stimulate synthesis of glycogen, fat, and storing energy. Now it does, it does more than just that. It also encourages a process called cellular respiration. But this is what insulin does. It's an anabolic hormone. Many athletes, well not many, but, but some athletes actually take, take more insulin to encourage even more, more growth and more storage. The very anabolic hormone. Okay, now we're going to have something called fasting state metabolism. Fasting state. And fasting state metabolism happens during um, time, or actually, let's just keep it, keep it simple. When blood glucose falls below homeostatic levels. And as we know, homeostasis is preferred levels. And if this happens, then the body's going to need to start to, to raise levels of blood, blood glucose pretty fast. And what triggers that is something that's going to be called glucagon. And glucagon is going to be released by something called alpha cells in the pancreas. Beta or, or insulin is going to be secreted by beta cells of the pancreas. So this is, is, is glucagon dominant. And because of that, the body is in a catabolic state. Because the goal is to raise blood glucose levels. What that, so what this does is that it is going to create a chemical process called hydrolysis. Hydro means water, lysis the cut. So it means basically to cut with water. 
and this is going to be catabolic. And it is going to encourage catabolism of glycogen, fats, and proteins. In case you're curious which order the body would prefer to take energy from, uh, glycogen first, then proteins, then fats. Um, in fact, in the short term, once glycogen stores are, de are depleted, kind of paradoxical because the body seems to go for proteins next in the short term, but in the long term, it goes, okay, fine, fine I'll take that. Because your, your body's always thinking, well, maybe I have food today, but what about tomorrow? What if there's no more Pop-Tarts in the, in the cabinet? What are you going to do for food? And fat is, fat is the saving account of your body that, uh, that it relies on in cases of famine. So you'd rather not tap into those if it doesn't have to. That's why when someone's dieting, it takes a while to really notice changes because the body is trying to hold on to that as much as possible. All right. So now we are going to talk about the very important uh, molecule called glucose. And glucose, what it is, is that it is a monomer. You can look that up online if you want, but it's just as a building block of a macromolecule. So it is a, mo a monomer that cells use to make ATP adenosine triphosphate. And what does ATP do? In short, it is going to allow for energy. It is going to allow for our body to, to perform functions. So obviously it's very important. Now, now glucose is water soluble. So it is water soluble, but the downside is it requires a lot of water to dilute. Apologies, a lot of water for dilution. Uh, now, why is that bad? That means that basically our blood can only support so much, so much uh, uh, glucose because as I'm sure you, you know, if you have sugar and not enough water, what's going to be made? Well, basically goo, right? So we, we can't have that, but it is water soluble. Glycogen, however, is water insoluble and is stored in the cells. That's a way of storing, storing excess glucose for later use. Now, they're the two things that use, use glucose in our body. There's two major organs. One is the brain, and the other is the system. And you're probably saying, well, why are you, um, why are you separating the two? Because the brain is something called insulin independent. Whereas the system, system cells is going to be insulin dependent. I hope I'm spelling dependent wrong, probably not. All right, that's why I will never make fun of anyone for, for, for spelling errors because my, there are some words that I just will never be able to spell right. Like separate, dependent, independent. I would say is there an A or an E in stupid vowels? I'm taking this test called the um, GRE and it's a test you take to get into grad school. Wholly unprepared for it. I definitely suggest studying for these exams first. And there is a section where, where you had to write an essay and I'm like, no problem, writing essays for years. Well, I noticed that it did not have spell checker. So it was a word, it was all a computer, it was word doc and there was no spell checker. So the way that I had to substitute words that I, I wasn't sure of. So like instead of separate and 
the paper was pulled apart from one piece into two. I mean, it was just really awkward. They probably were looking at this and saying, did this guy come in here drunk or something? Yeah. Um, but anyways, the system is insulin dependent. What this means is that cells will absolutely not import glucose for energy without insulin. That's a very important point because there's a condition called diabetes mellitus, excessive water that is sweet, and that's because you have all this, this glucose floating in the blood because the cells are not receiving the signal to take it in. Without insulin, the cells will not take in glucose for energy. Okay. Now, if there is excess blood glucose, as I said, it will be converted into glycogen for storage. And glycogen is mainly stored by the liver and the skeletal, and not, not skeletal, but the muscles. That's a process called glycogenesis. Glyco stands for, for glycogen. And genesis means to make a new. So glycogenesis is the process of making glycogen. Though, as I said, that that glycogen is a storage molecule. It's made up of chains of thousands of glucose molecules, monomers. It's analogous to starch in plants. Starch is the plant version of uh, glycogen. So chains of thousands of glucose molecules. And what's the big benefit of it is that it is going to be water insoluble, meaning it will not contribute to the concentration of blood glucose, well, in the blood. And it's also compact, so two very important qualities. Now, if glycogen needs to be converted into glucose, we have another term, glyco for glycogen, gen to make, lysis to break apart. And this is going to be from glycogen to glucose. Radical. And the other term is going to be I'm running out of room here. I'll go ahead and erase this. Because I put in way too much space here. The next one is kind of a uh, kind of a mouthful to say. It is going to be Gluco. Can't write with an eraser. Gluco for glucose. Neo to make brand new. Genesis. So this means to make new glucose from nothing. And this is when you have, for example, amino acids to glucose. Yes, lots of people have this attitude that sugar will make you fat. So the best way to not get fat is to not eat sugar. It is actually very hard, very, very different from the, the truth. Somebody was to eat a diet, basically just sugar, they would they would waste away. It's it is not sugar that makes that makes someone fat. It's actually very hard to get fat off of just sugar. But if you have foods that are high in both fat and sugar, well, yeah, that's going to result in high calorie foods. But it's mainly the fat part of it, not the sugar. Now you're probably saying, well, why is it that, um, why is it that most junk food is made out of sugar? 
Well, keep in mind, it isn't the sugar that makes someone obese. It is the calories. And keep in mind, fat is very calorie dense. So when you take, take something that is high in fat and high in sugar, not only is it very energy dense, but you actually trigger changes in your brain because your brain finds that, or your, your, your brain is hardwired to release dopamine when you eat food that is high in fats and, and sugars. It's to reward you to eat more so you can store that energy in case of famine. So your body can actually get dependent on it too, due to like anything else, down regulation. Anyways though, if, if someone eats excessive amounts of one, one macronutrient, such as fat or, or amino acids, it can convert it into, into sugar. It's not gonna like it. It's a conversion process. It's going to make you feel terrible, but that's what it is. All right, and after this, we're going to talk about diabetes, and then we're going to move on to part two of of the outline. All right, everyone, well, welcome. We're now going to be talking about diabetes type one and type two. And when we say diabetes type one and type two, we'll, we are referring to mellitus. So there's two forms of diabetes mellitus. And we have type one, and type one is actually going to be destruction of beta-1 cells, usually due to an autoimmune response. So that happens is that for whatever reason, your immune system has marked your beta cells for destruction. So first, before I do that, let me just make sure that we know exactly how uh, this process works. So what happens is that, that beta cells are going to taste or detect levels of a solute that we've been talking about called glucose. And let's go ahead and put that in teal. So sorry, let me add glucose to our the legend here. And it's going to detect levels of uh, glucose. Then what, it's, then what it's going to do is it is going to secrete, let me draw another bloodstream here. It is going to secrete an appropriate amount of insulin into the bloodstream as a means of telling the cells how much glucose to take in. So here we have insulin. So it is going to detect the amount of glucose in the blood and the beta cells, they're not only sensors, but they're also, if we're, if we're gonna use the same terminology, integrating centers. So they are going to release a certain amount of insulin in the bloodstream. Because the goal is that the, the body wants to maintain a preferred level of glucose in the blood. So that happens then is that the insulin is going to bind with the receptors, and then it is going to tell Tell the, or tell the cell to import glucose, which I'm not gonna draw a separate bloodstream here, but it's just gonna go like this, through a glute protein. And this will have the effect of lowering blood glucose. That's the goal of insulin, to lower blood glucose. All right, so that's all fine and good. But with diabetes type one, this pathway is going to change quite a bit over time. And it is usually a slow and insidious process because as we talked about, the brain is going to be insulin independent. So your brain is still going to function fine for the most part. The problem is going to be your system cells. Since they are insulin dependent, they're not, they're not gonna get the, uh, the, the, the glucose that they need and they're, they're gonna switch to a backup pathway if you wanna call it called um, um, where they release ketones into the blood. The ketones are acidic in very large quantities, leading to a condition called, called ketogenic acidosis. 
So anyways, what happens with diabetes type 1 is that the beta cells are going to be destroyed over time. So what's going to happen here is that we are going to have insufficient to no insulin secretion. So, so what effect is that going to have? Well, if we don't have beta cells, we can't secrete insulin into the blood. If we can't secrete insulin into the blood, then the body cells will not be able to take in glucose. What's going to happen as a result, if you want to refer to the, to the larger or to the top of the screen, is glucose is going to be present in very large quantities. And of, and of course, we know what's, what's going to happen is that if this, this glucose is not removed, it's going to end up in the nephron and then it's greeted through the urine. So the effect is going to be insufficient to no insulin secretion. And what's going to happen is that, is that over time, fewer and fewer cells are going to receive the insulin signal to import the glucose monomer. And the effect overall is going to be, is going to become worse over time. So the effect is, is going to be that even though the brain receives, sees adequate amounts of glucose, the body cells will not, you know, result in a condition called ketogenic, if it's really bad, acidosis. Now, what is going to be the therapy for that? Well, you would, you would need to inject insulin because since your beta cells are not making it, you have to inject it. And how much you inject depends on what you eat and how fast it gets into your bloodstream. Diabetics have to determine something called the, the glycemic index, which is basically a number uh, referring to how fast a food will, um, will uh, Will, will turn into glucose in your blood. Doesn't mean the food is bad or good. It is just a measurement of how much insulin that a diabetic person needs, needs to inject in order for their um, blood glucose levels to maintain nor, um, normality. It's hard though, because um, there's many foods that have, have hidden sugars in them. Like my uncle by marriage, is a type one diabetic and what gets him is pizza crust. He'll think that, okay, well, I'm gonna have a, a slice of pizza. He measures out everything very carefully. And many times he finds out that um, the, the amount of sugar in the food was not, was not as advertised. And of course, if you talk to, you know, the pizza place and you ask the poor person at the front desk, Hey, uh, uh, do you guys add extra sugar to your pizza dough? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. So yeah, it's part of the, it's part of the problem. So th this is a uh, time to note that untreated diabetes, either type one or type two results in a condition called hyperglycemia. It just means too much sugar. Hyperglycemia causes problems over time. It messes up lots of systems. Um, yeah, it basically has an effect on almost every, every major body system over time. Don't have enough, um, speaking of time, don't have enough time to, to get into it now. Um, type two diabetes is a little bit different. Well, before we talk about that, let's, let's talk about hypoglycemia. And hypoglycemia, if hyperglycemia is too much sugar, hypoglycemia is too low blood glucose. I know that I call it blood sugar, but it's the appropriate term is blood glucose. Now, when does this, this happen? Um, it can happen after long periods of not eating, but that's not, that's not common. What mainly happens is that if somebody injects too much, much insulin, meaning that what's going to happen is that they didn't eat as much sugar, for example, as they thought, or maybe they injected a certain amount of insulin expecting to eat um, a, a certain amount of uh, food, but instead they changed their mind or didn't eat enough. Now, hypoglycemia can be fatal in the short term because if your brain is not getting enough 
enough glucose, then the person can become delirious, even violent, um, unconscious, and and they can snowball from there. So, speaking of that, the the same same uncle, this happened years ago. I would say maybe gosh, uh, over twenty years ago. So what happened is that he in, he injected insulin, and and he was in a hurry, and he didn't didn't eat enough. He uh, got in his car and drove off. And next thing thing he re remembers, he was in the hospital with a broken back. And piecing it to, to, together, what happened is um, somehow he pulled off on the side of the road. Uh, the EMTs were called somehow, and he's not exactly sure how this happened, but somehow maybe there was a, a, a struggle with the EMTs. These people who are, are hypoglycemic can uh, tend to become violent even. Uh, because they're they're very disoriented, and um, somehow he he broke his back, and really there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle that we're not sure of. Maybe he maybe he fell out of the car. I mean it's it's a lot of things that we're not we're not sure of. But it's just an example of the effects on cognition that that that, that the hypoglycemia has. So this is type one diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a bit different. Now, the result is the same, hyperglycemia. The effect is elevated blood glucose. And so really, the cause is slightly different, but the effects are the same. So type 2 is insulin insufficiency which is, I mean, uh, I know that a lot of people associate type 2 diabetes with obesity. And yes, there is a correlation between that. So what happens is that beta cells, like any other cell over time, is going to get older. When it gets older, what's, what's going to happen is it's going to become less efficient. If somebody leads a lifestyle, where they, where they uh, eat large amounts of sugary foods, what's going to happen is that similar to this top bloodstream here, is they are going to have excessive amounts of glucose in the blood. Now, when that, that person was younger and, and healthier, they were able to secrete adequate amounts of glucose, sorry, of insulin in the, in the blood. The cells were able to take it in and everyone was happy. However, over time, these beta cells become less efficient. So I'm going to draw lines here to show less efficient. It becomes less efficient. Because of that, the person's diet does not change. However, the, uh, the, the uh, amount of insulin secreted lessens, leading to hyperglycemia. Um, uh, so, in, so in this case here, the beta cells lose their efficiency. And sadly, because of our modern diet, is people are becoming type 2 diabetics even in their, in their 30s, which is, is terribly sad. So insufficient insulin secretion. But I do want to note the effect is the same. However, the difference is, is that this can likely be modified from lifestyle, I'll just call it lifestyle adjustments. So what this means is that if somebody is developing symptoms of type two diabetes, which usually starts off as pre-diabetes, meaning that their blood glucose is slightly elevated, if they just eat less sugary foods, their symptoms will return to normal. Type two diabetes runs in my family, my dad's side of the family. When my dad first developed um, uh, hyperglycemia, I, I, uh, I put him on the Atkins diet. He lost 20, 30 pounds, and his blood glucose levels returned to normal. Now, of course, unfortunately, my dad has the personality where the moment he is, quote, unquote, cured, he just falls back into his old habits and doesn't tell, tell me about it either. To, to, uh, to give you an example, my dad takes 
takes medicine to control his, his hypertension. I believe it's lisinopril. So I was talking to him and I'm like, yeah, dad, how'd your doctor's visit go? And he said, oh, my, my, uh, my blood, blood pressure's up again. I'm like, oh, so what did he do? Adjust his, adjust your, your medicine? And he said, no, he told me to start, start taking it again. And I'm like, when did you stop, dad? He said, oh, I, I, I stopped a couple months ago. And I said, why? And he said, oh, well, my blood pressure came back down. So I didn't think I needed it anymore. And I gave him this look and I'm like, dad, you, you know, I, I know that I'm an idiot and all, but why don't you just, you know, run this stuff by me? It's not like I teach it or anything. Oh, well, I didn't need to know. I, I, didn't, I thought it, I was fine. And yeah. And I'm like, all right, dad, whatever. So, so yeah, my, my dad, his, uh, I'll talk to him on occasion and I'll go, yeah, dad, how do your, your, your uh, blood tests come out? Oh, the A1C is up again. <clears throat> and I'm like, why? Oh, I don't know. So I asked my mom and she goes, yeah, yeah, he's, 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 he's been eating, uh, sugary foods again. I'm like, of course, obviously. So that's the difference between type one and type two diabetes. <coughs> Excuse me. Once again, type one diabetes, you have destruction of beta cells resulting in eventually um, partial or complete loss of insulin secreting cells. The result is hyperglycemia. And this one is more severe over time because if the system cells are not receiving insulin, then you will have have ketogenic acidosis, which is a condition that can lead to long-term or uh, uh, organ failure over time. However, type two diabetes is insulin insufficiency. The individual still secretes insulin, just not enough to make their blood glucose levels the normal value. Usually the first line step with this is lifestyle adjustments. And, and hyperglycemia, creates complications over the long-term. Hypoglycemia causes very severe short-term effects. So, so although, although neither one is desirable, being, being, being hypoglycemic is definitely worse in the short-term. Okay, everyone, so we are now on to what's called fed state metabolism. And fed state metabolism happens basically within a couple hours after you eat. It's called fed state because you have nutrients coursing through your system. And as I said before, it is insulin mediated. It is dominated by the hormone insulin. Now, why is that? Because the beta cells on your pancreas, they are designed to detect when glucose levels are above homeostatic levels. Now it is one thing to note that both um, beta cells and alpha cells, just to put here, so this is, so I'm gonna put this orange dot here as normal, and I'm going to put here in purple, too low, and I'm going to put here in, or in red, too high. So what happens here is that beta cells, which secrete insulin, they are going to work in this range here. And alpha cells, which secrete glucagon, and glucagon, as I said before, it hasn't gotten much attention so far, but glucagon is going to raise blood glucose levels by breaking down storage, storage, um, storage reservoirs of uh, glycogen into glucose. So they don't over, overlap. I guess the term is antagonistic, is they both work on opposite ranges. And of course, the goal is to restore glucose to homeostatic levels. So what happens in fed state metabolism? Your digestive system has worked incredibly hard to break down the complex carbohydrates you ate and the complex proteins you ate and the complex fats that you ate and utilize them 
for either immediate use or for storage. So we're gonna use glucose as an example here. We'll do glucose as these nice green dots. And we'll go ahead and put insulin here as we'll stay with the purple that I did in the, in the other diagram. And you were gonna have your body cells. So during, during fed state metabolism, a couple things are gonna happen. Well, the first is that the glucose that is coursing with your bloodstream, what's gonna happen is that, that the insulin is going to bind to, to the insulin receptor that is going to import glucose. It's going to go into the cell. And it is going to go into the cell and undergo cellular respiration. Uh, let me just make sure I don't have cellular respiration somewhere else in here. All right, so if you want the basics of cellular respiration, so what's going to happen is that we are going to have a process called glycolysis. And to do so, I'm going to go ahead and erase this. So this is what's going to happen when insulin tells your body cells, because as I said, your body cells are very obedient. I'm going to tell your body cells to import the glucose. So insulin is going to bind here, and glucose is going to enter. And it's going to enter a stage which actually is multi-steps called glycolysis, glycolysis, the process of breaking down sugars into a molecule called pyruvate. So what's going to happen is it's a series of steps, but I'm going to just draw a couple and you'll see why in a bit. So one intermediate step in the process is going to be called um, glycog er, apologies, glucose 6-phosphate. That's just one step in a very complex pathway. And the ultimate effects or the ultimate outcome is going to be pyruvate along with, with some other uh, coenzymes that will go into cellular respiration, but that isn't the, <clears throat> that isn't the goal of this uh, chapter of this um, diagram here. Now, if oxygen is present, it's going to undergo a process called citric acid. Um, it, it's going to enter the citric acid cycle. If not, it's going to enter something called anaerobic respiration. And the effects of that are going to be, sorry to write on the bottom small, it's going to be ATP and a byproduct called lactate. Lactate, there we go. That is a byproduct of anaerobic respiration. In plants, it's ethanol, also known as the stuff that goes into your alcohol. Sorry, ethanol is alcohol. Yes, okay, now moving on. So we have this organelle here called the mitochondria. It is, a, it is an organelle that actually has two membranes. So it's a, it's a double membrane um, organelle. And it's actually going to be very much folded, but I'm not going to draw those folds. So that happens is that if O2 is present, it's going to go into the mitochondria and it's going to be converted to a compound called acetyl-CoA, which will also come into play a little bit later on. It's going to enter a process called the citric acid cycle. And in the citric acid cycle, one of the major byproducts made is going to be CO2. But, but you're also going to have the, um, a series of, of reactions called redox reactions, where uh, more or less the chemical bonds in acetyl-CoA will be broken to form um, NADH and FADH2. These are going to be hydrogen and, and electron carriers. Then you're going to have the electron transport chain or 
actually is more a uh, more correct term oxidative phosphorylation and I'm not going to talk about this much because we're talking about metabolism here not exactly about making ATP but the final step is going to be the phosphorylation of ADP into ATP in very large quantities. So that's the process of cellular respiration. Now, if there is too much, so after cellular respiration occurs, if there are still, if the, the, the system is still in a hyperglycemic state, now it's time for storage. So if after all the cells have taken in the, the glucose, so draw here in bright green, and there's still too, too much, then the insulin is going to prompt the, the conversion of glucose into glycogen. Now, as I said before, this is going to be uh, mediated by insulin as a signaling molecule. You are going to have the glucose monomers. They are going to be chained together in thousands of bonds to form glycogen. Now, this, this glycogen is mainly stored in the two areas. One is going to be skeletal muscle, and the other is going to be the liver. Let's see if I can draw a liver. Yeah. Kind of looks like a fish. So some of it is going to be stored in the liver. I'll just draw something like this. And some of it is going to be stored in the, in the skeletal muscle. However, it's important to note that if, if glucose is broken down via, via the liver, it's going to enter the bloodstream. So if glycogen is broken down into glucose or, or glucose 6-phosphate, it's going to enter the bloodstream. Skeletal muscle, though, doesn't really export it. The glycogen in the skeletal muscle is used for the purposes of the skeletal muscle. Okay. All right, so next we are going to talk about triglycerides, and this one's going to be a bit complicated. Now, you don't have to eat fats to make fats. So what's going to happen here, so I'm going to re redraw myself for cellular respiration. So that happens basically is that is that let's say that somebody's going to decide that fat's not going to happen. They're not going to eat fats. So what can happen is that through glycolysis is, of course, of course, we know that the process is going to be two molecules of pyruvate, but pyruvate is kind of a ubiquitous, um, uh, ubiquitous inter intermediary. Py pyruvate can actually run backwards slightly through glycolysis and it can form a sugar alcohol, so to speak, called glycerol. And, and glycerol, because if you re remember, a fatty acid is going to be a glycerol head. Now what can also happen is that when pyruvate goes into the mitochondria with oxygen, going to form a compound called acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA, through a series of processes, can be converted into fatty acids. So you can actually make fats from glycerol. However, I don't believe it is possible to synthesize cholesterol without dietary cholesterol. I think that, I don't think that is, that is a possibility by the, 
um, by the uh, body, but I'll have to double check that. I'm, I'm kind of speaking off the cuff here. And I do know that the body does need some fats uh, taken in because I don't think all types of fats can be made from this process here. So you'll be doing your body a huge disservice if you cut out all fats because I know it cannot function properly and cannot function the hormones that you, that you, that you need but it is still possible to make fats in the absence of fats. So is an amazing machine. And triglycerides are going to be stored into storage cells called adipose cells. So adipose cells are the storage sites of triglycerides. That is the first part of state metabolism. All right, so now we're going to talk about a process, very important process called, well, actually, before we, we do that, let's, let's go ahead and talk about proteins. So we already talked about what happens with with sugars. But what about proteins, also known as amino acids, the building block? If, if you recall from last, from last chapter, is our body also spends a lot of energy breaking down the long chains of peptides into the individual building blocks, amino acids. Now, when I was in my bro stage back in the 90s, is GNC, which was basically the bro, um, the bro shopping mall, um, they sold a, a lot of amino acid supplements. And the, and the idea was, well, okay, um, you want to get these, uh, these amino acids directly into your blood. And me being an idiot at 14 years, years old, that's my excuse, is I just decided, oh, well, protein... Um, is different from uh, from amino acids. So basically, I just spent uh, spent a, a lot of money for what my body would do for free. But anyways, it is a learning process. So what do we 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 do with them? Well, as you guys know, we are protein-based life forms, and our proteins are constantly degrading, constantly uh, being stressed, constantly used up, and constantly need to be built. And depending on your body size, you should be getting at least 60 grams of protein. And for carbohydrates, I think they say it's 300 grams. That's because your brain per day uses about 160 grams of, of glucose. So your body needs these. It isn't just calories, it's building blocks. So the first thing it's used is for synthesis. What's interesting is that your liver actually has first dibs on your, your blood levels of amino acids. So the first thing is that your liver uses these amino acids to create proteins. Your liver makes a lot of proteins that just circulate in your blood, a lot of them. Albumin, um, a complement, which we'll learn about next, next chapter, um, angiotensinogen, for example. So those are very important. Oh, uh, I'm also low-density lipoprotein, high-density lipoprotein. So your liver actually has first dibs on the circulating levels of amino acids. All right, the next part is going to be used by cells. For example, muscle cells, um, all cells. And this is going to be used to make enzymes, muscle proteins, structural proteins, just to give you some brief examples 
but your cells are constantly using up its enzymes. It constantly needs to make and repair structural proteins and muscle proteins. Even if you don't do much per day, they are still being damaged and they need to be repaired. That's why they, su they suggest if you're very active, you lift weights a lot, you run a lot, you're damaging the muscle protein fibers. So it's a good idea to get some extra protein to help to, or make sure that the muscles have enough building blocks to be repaired. What's interesting though, is that if you have too much, much protein, it can actually be converted into energy. Uh, this is not ideal. If your body is using proteins to make energy, that means you're taking in way too much protein and not enough fats and carbs. Some, some people, especially when they're extreme dieting, is they'll, is they'll go on a diet that's a lot of lean proteins and fibrous vegetables. They feel miserable. Your body can make energy from proteins, but it doesn't like it. And it's a slow process. And it's a process called deamination. DE means without. Amin means amine. Deamination. So what happens here is if you re remember um, your your basic chemistry class is amino acids generally are made up of the following components. In our group, which um, is different for each amino acid, then it also has in a mean group, NH3, I believe. This is called in a, a mean group. Actually, let me double check that. It's either NH3 or NH4. I always forget. NH3 plus. NH3. NH3. I got it right? Nice. Yeah, it's a morning. Nice. So NH3 is going to be the uh, amine group. And then we have the carboxyl group, which is COOH minus. It's called carboxyl, also known as, 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 uh, as carbolytic acid, but I just call it carboxyl. So that is the acid group, amine acid. So anyways, what, what, what our body can do is it can use, use an enzyme mediated process to re remove this amine group. And it's going to convert it into urea goes through a couple of processes to convert it to urea, which as we know is used in, in the renal system either to maintain osmolarity or it is going to be excreted from the body. And this group here, the carboxyl group, can be turned into pyruvate. And, and as we know, pyruvate is an energy pathway intermediary because it results from, it is the end product of glycolysis. The problem is, is that urea is made. And if you have too much protein that is converted to energy, you are going to have high levels of, of urea. Probably will not surprise you at all, but when, but when, but when I was in peak, in peak growth stage, I, I, had, I, I had an ultrasound done because of uh, some pain I was having in my back. And the nurse goes, or the technician goes and says, I'll be right back. And then she leaves and a doctor comes in and he goes, uh, I was looking at your ultrasound, sir, and you have uric acid stones. And I'm like, Rrr? and he said, yeah. And he goes, how much protein do you eat? And I'm like, um, a lot. So I was, so I actually can say I got uric acid stones from eating way too much protein because I was eating way too much protein. My, my body said, okay, well, I guess we'll just use it for energy. And that's what it did. So 
that is definitely a warning for you all because apparently uric acid stones are very resilient and they would have done very bad things if they tried to pass. Luckily, um, it's from, from, from what I understand, the stones are pretty water um, soluble. So they actually broke up over time, thankfully, or else I would have been a very sad person, very sad bro. All right, now, if you think that protein cannot be turned to fat, you are definitely wrong because the other thing that can happen is going to be called, called this three, it's, it's going to be storage. And what's, what's, what's going to happen is that recall that I said that amino acids can be turned into pyruvate. Well, pyruvate, if oxygen is present, then it can turn into a compound called acetyl-CoA, which normally enters what we call the Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle. All right, that's all fine and good, but if too much acetyl-CoA is made, then your body has to figure out what to, what to do with it. And one possible fate is it can be turned into a triglyceride, which as we know, triglycerides are actually used to create fat cells or, or, or adipose cells. As I said, this process is slow, but you can definitely gain fat mass by eating too much protein. It's going to be terrible for you because urea is still made as a byproduct. So you're, you're going to be very unhappy if you just decide that protein is going to be your main source of calorie intake. Very can, can sad. Can clarify that the Krebs cycle is being bypassed to make the to triglycerides? Exactly, yeah, because once the amount or the synthesis of acetyl-CoA exceeds the Krebs cycle ability to, to, to use it, recall that our body is very efficient, our cells are extremely efficient, and it's going to store it. If conditions are right, because as we'll talk about toward the end of lecture, excess acetyl-CoA can also be used to make something called a ketone body. All right, great. So you can store amino acids as fat. So these are the three uses of, of, uh, of amino acids. So now let's move on to fats. I have a question. What's sure. the, for number two, the amino acids can be converted through a process called? DMA. Oh, that's cool. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to draw here the lymphatic system. Well, let's call it lymph. And eventually, it's going to connect on to the venous system, which is the blood. And we know that our blood can, can reach um, any other cell in our body. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and use the class again. As I said, you have to unmute yourself is we have the blood here. And we know that the blood can reach any other type of cell in the body. So now I'm going to draw here an adipose cell. And I'm going to draw here a liver cell. Is it the triglycerides? Mm-hmm. So this is going to be fats and what our body does with triglycerides. And of course, we have here a very big structure, vitally important structure called the liver. And then of course, we can't forget about our normal body cells. That's ugly. Okay, so recall that triglycerides are going, to, are going to enter our blood through the lymphatic system. 
What's going to happen, if you remember, there's something called a chylomicron. Going to enter the lymphatic system. And then it's eventually going, going to enter our blood. So what's going to happen is there's an enzyme that is that's, that circles around in our blood, secreted by the liver, and it is called lipolysase C, also known as LPL. L L. And what that's going to do is it is going to break apart this chylomicron and it is going to convert the, tri, the tri, triglycerides in it. It's going to convert it into glycerol and fatty acids. Okay. So there are a couple of options here. If there's, there's, there's excess fat that is made, the glycerol and the fatty acids actually are going to be stored in, in the adipose cells. So one, so one possibility is that these are going to go into the adipose cells and it is going to be converted very easily into triglycerides for storage. So one option is going to be the formation of triglycerides. However, both the glycerol and the, the, and the fatty acids, they can actually go into the body cells where they can be used as energy. So glycerol plus fatty acids. And this generally happens if somebody is following a ketogenic diet. And ketogenic diets, if you know anything about them, is they rely on fats to make energy because the, because the intake of glucose is very low. So glycerol and fatty acids can be used to make energy. Okay. Um, now, as now as far as as cholesterol goes, because recall that that cholesterol is a very important component of a chylomicron. So draw here in dark green cholesterol. So that is going to go into the liver, and one one possibility for it. Is, is that it is going to be converted into something called a lipoprotein. It's going to be stored on a lipoprotein. Actually, let me, let me, let me back, backtrack that. It enters, because recall that, that this is from the blood, enters via what we call HDL, which is high density lipoprotein, write that up here. High density lipoprotein. High density lipoprotein is called the quote unquote good cholesterol. And the reason why it's called that is because it actually takes, takes cholesterol from the bloodstream and brings it to the liver for processing. So it gets it out of your blood, which is what you want. But it exits via low density lipoprotein. And this isn't the best because if you have too much low, low density lipoprotein in the blood, it's going to be eventually stored or it's going to um, contribute to a condition called atherosclerosis. Fortunately, we were not able to talk about it this semester, but it is a rather fascinating process. So, it can, so, so it's going to enter, enter the liver through your HDL, high, high density lipoproteins, and it's going to exit via low density lipoproteins. 
And what liver does with, with cholesterol, there's plenty of things it can do with it. One thing that it, it, it can do, though, is it can be converted to, to bile. So, so cholesterol either converted to bile or it is sent to cells. Sent to cells via low-density lipoprotein. All right. So let's go ahead and, and review this. We know that a chylomicron, which is a collection of proteins, a, a collection of fatty acids, triglycerides, so on and so forth, enters the lymph lymphatic system. And then eventually, it's going to enter the blood. The blood has an enzyme called lipolase C. This enzyme is going to convert triglycerides into glycerol and fatty acids. So depending on the conditions of the body, is glycerol and fatty acids are either going to be used for cellular energy, or it can also be stored as adipose or fat for long-term uh, storage, which is very easy because it isn't hard to, to combine cholesterol and fatty acids to make triglycerides. What's going to happen with cholesterol? It's going to enter the... The, the, the liver on proteins called high-density lipoprotein uh, carriers. And, and liver can do a, multiple, uh, a multitude of things with it. One thing is that it will repackage it to cells via low-density lipoprotein, or it could actually convert it to bile along with old red, red blood cells, which as we know, bile is in emulsifier. All right, any questions on fat metabolism? Yeah, so when the LPL, when it breaks it down to glycerol and fatty acids, did you say that it could do both, where it can be stored in the cells and the adipose tissue, mm -hmm. or does it choose vice versa? Uh, probably it's, it's, its, main, its main preference is to be used by cells, but if there's a lot left over, then it's stored in the adipose tissue. Thanks. You got it. Very important though, cholesterol has been demonized by the media for whatever reason. Your body actually makes quite a bit more cholesterol that can be um, uh, taken in. So dietary cholesterol is not nearly as big of an issue now um, as it was about 20 years ago because cholesterol was blamed for a lot of things. If you have high cholesterol levels, you are in the same boat as I am, and it is genetic. If your parents have, have high cholesterol levels, you probably will too. There's nothing you can do for it, except you can either drastically cut your intake of cholesterol, which won't do much, or you can go on a statin. I am on a statin, and one of the main, main benefits of that is statins actually uh, partially inhibit the process of atherosclerosis. I know that with diabetics, one thing that they suggest to rapidly increase blood glucose levels is to drink, drink something sugary, like, like orange juice. But if somebody is unconscious because of hypoglycemia, why would orange juice be a terrible idea? You would choke them, it would aspirate. Exactly, exactly. They would, they would, uh, you would just make a bad problem even worse. So instead, you would inject a hormone called glucagon. It's actually a gel you can put buccally. Really? Yep. That's news, that's news to me. I always thought it wasn't, um, it would have to be injected, but wow. Yeah, they made it a gel because it's easier to, um, well, I, obviously injection would be fast as well, but when I used to work in a nursing home, we didn't always have the injections, so it would be the glucagon um, buccal gel. We would just put it on the inside of their, their lip. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's super cool. In our body, glucagon is secreted by cells called alpha cells. 
And the pancreas has both beta cells and alpha cells, much more, more beta cells than alpha cells. I believe it's a four to one ratio, but the alpha cells secrete glucagon. And glucagon's job is to promote increases in blood glucose. Its job is to return blood glucose to homeostatic levels. So, so, so glucagon is going to be what we call catabolic. It is a very catabolic hormone. Its job is to return, return uh, glucose to the bloodstream to be used by the cells and especially the brain. All right, so the first thing that is, that is going to happen is glucagon actually promotes glycogen conversion into glucose. It's a process that we call um, Glucogenolysis. So what it does is it takes, takes. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, I made a massive error. Glycogenolysis. G-L-Y-C-O-G-E-N-Y-L-Y-S-I-S. Glycogenolysis, what it means is that you're taking glycogen and cutting it to create glucose. And there are two, two tissues that, that do this. One is muscle tissue. And the other is the liver. And of course, there is quite a difference between them because muscles, muscles use, use glycogen to fuel their own activities. So the, the glycogen stored in, in the muscles does not leave the muscle. Instead, the glycogen is going to be converted into pyruvate. And, and as we know, pyruvate is going to be either used for fermentation or oxidative phosphorylation. So the glycogen that's stored in the muscles does not return to the blood. So that, re that relies on the liver. The liver uses a series of enzymes that's going to convert glycogen directly into, into glucose. I know that's really ugly spelling, but it's going to convert it directly into glucose and it's going to return it to the bloodstream. The liver and to a smaller extent, the kidney are the only places in the body where glycogen can be converted to, to glucose. All right, Alec, you are free to um, ask your question. So um, what is glucagon then? So glucagon is a, a catabolic hormone that is secreted from the alpha, uh, the alpha cells. It is a peptide hormone. So what it does is it is going to 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 promote um, lysis. It's going to to uh, to stimulate conversion of adipose cells and store 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 glycogen levels. It's going to promote their breakdown to return to return glucose to the bloodstream to um, raise blood glucose levels. Got it. So literally, it, it's not an energy molecule in a sense. It just helps 
convert um, a storage energy molecule into a usable energy molecule. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I was, I was getting at. Yeah, so the idea behind, behind glucagon is it takes your stored energy, um, it takes your stored fats, your stored glycogen, and it returns them into their simpler parts. And, and glucagon converts or, or promotes the breakdown of glycogen into either glucose if it's the, the liver or pyruvate if it's the muscles. And that's because only the liver has the proper enzymes to convert glycogen to glucose. The liver, and as I said, to a, a smaller extent, the kidneys. Now, Shannon asked a good question. What about my energy drinks? Well, these are actually, I, I drink the ones that are low carb, low in sugar. But glycogen is one hormone that promotes the breakdown of glycogen to glucose. But another one is epinephrine. And caffeine stimulates the release, of, uh, the release of epinephrine, which of course is, is going to promote a glycogen into glucose breakdown. So that's because, so that's why when I take my, my uh, massive amounts of caffeine a day, on the one hand, I'm more alert, but on the other hand, I get very jittery. And that's because my sympathetic nervous system is actually being activated. So yes, right now some stored glycogen in my, my body is being converted into, into glucose. And it is basically floating around having no place to go because I'm not really doing too much active. I think she, she was asking a question when we were talking about the proteins. Does oh, it have a lot of protein? Oh, in the proteins. Um, energy drinks do not have much, much protein. Oh, well, Shannon, uh, I, asked, I answered a question that hopefully you learned something from it. I don't want to get... Okay. So anyways, moving right down on... Wait, Professor. Yes. I don't want to get too off topic, but um, why is intermittent fasting okay? Wouldn't that same process happen during the fasting? Um, so intermittent fasting is interesting. What you are doing is your body's relying on stored, stored glycogen during the day, and then you restore those, those glycogen levels at night. I've, I've done intermittent fasting before, and I think it works great just because you can only fit so much food into your, your stomach at one time. So intermittent fasting not only um, uh, makes your body um, more efficient at, at, using, at, at using energy, but it also prevents you from overeating. Of course, the downside is, is your social life just goes down the drain. I'll tell your friends, oh yeah, I'll, I'll go to Chili's with you and I'll get some water because I can only eat at night. So uh, socially, it isn't the best way of eating, but of course, since we're in social isolation, if any of you do wanna try um, uh, the intermittent fasting method, it actually works really well. I'm a big, big fan of it. Works for what, like a diet? Yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of people who have lost a lot of weight on it. It is. I think because when it comes to dieting, uh, like a lot of people need a plan. They, they need rules to follow. And intermittent fasting is basically um, don't eat during the day. And you can eat basically whatever you want at night as long as it's um, decently healthy food. So it really pre it, it 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 really prevents people from eating too much. That's the main idea behind it. I think there's a few different ways to do it. Like there's some people that do like a 16 and 8. Mm -hmm. So they'll fast for 16 hours and they eat for 8 hours. Some people like well, I have a friend who lost like over 100 pounds between keto and intermittent fasting mm -hmm. and she fasted she only ate from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Yeah, it works. It works really well as as long as you do not eat very calorie dense food. Yeah, it works really well. I know a lot of people who have lost a lot of weight on it. And yeah, I I think the only the only criticism I I have with diets like like that is can the person maintain healthy eating habits 
when they decide to go back to normal eating. And that's the, the, the biggest enemy is most diet plans, they're designed to keep you dependent on them. They don't teach you how to fish. They, they keep, keep giving you fish, if that makes sense. But yeah, I would, we can go over this during office hours or during lab, more than happy to. Protein, we already talked about that. Your body actually wants to break down proteins for energy before fat. It's interesting. In studies they've, they've done with um, how the body responds to a calorie deficit is first, of course, stored, stored glycogen is going to be used. Then after that, your body is going to use muscle protein. It's going to break down your, your, your muscles for energy. And then after a couple of days, it's going to say, well, okay, it's going to relent and it's going to start to catabolize your adipose cells. So anyways, what is going to happen with lipids? Because we do know that long-term, if the person cannot find food, either purposefully if they're dieting or accidentally, if there's a famine or a period of starvation, they're going to eventually need to break down the adipose cells. So what happens is that we have a, we have a, a couple options here. So here's our cell. So going back to, to review something we talked about is triglycerides. They are broken down using lipolysase C. Actually, I'll just do LPL to keep things nice and easy. To become glycerol. And fatty acids. So what happens is that our cells can use either of these two, two molecules uh, for, for stuff. The first is going to be glycerol. So glycerol is technically considered a carbohydrate. I believe it's in a class called a sugar alcohol. But anyways, glycerol can actually enter glycolysis at a later stage. So it can actually enter as an intermediary of glycolysis, and they can be turned into pyruvate. And as we know, pyruvate can be used by the cell either for anaerobic respiration or aerobic respiration. Now, the other thing is going to be the fatty acids. Fatty acids, they can also be converted to a compound called acetyl-CoA. It is a, a process called um, beta-oxidation. And this happens in the mitochondria, beta oxidation. Now, why is this significant? Because, because fatty acids, when they're converted to acetyl-CoA, it's converted into a lot of acetyl-CoA. And it's going to create lots of excess. So what's going to happen is that in this case, the excess acetyl-CoA is actually going to be sent out of the cell and it's going to go to the liver. And the liver is going to convert the acetyl-CoA It's going to convert it into something called a ketone body. ketone body. And an example of a ketone body is called acetone. Anyone know a product that contains acetone? Nail polish remover. Exactly, nail polish remover. And you know that it has a very distinctive smell. 
So what happens is that the people that are on a ketogenic diet, the, the thing that they are doing is they are reducing their intake of sugars and increasing their intake of fats. The diet only works if your fat intake is high. But it's important to be careful because fats are very calorie dense. And people think that ketogenic diets, and this was very common during, during the Atkins diet, is they thought, oh, so I can eat fats. So I'm going to have a side of bacon, uh, fried in bacon grease, then topped with um, a sugar-free syrup and uh, mixed with hash browns. I don't know. I'm, well, not hash browns. Um, mixed with, I don't know, a hamburger. And I'm being kind of silly here, but there were people that actually would go to uh, hometown buffet at the time or Golden Corral, and they would just eat sick amounts of uh, fatty meats. That's not the idea behind keto. The idea behind a ketogenic diet is fats are the dominant macromolecule that is consumed. So what's going to happen is that blood glucose levels are going to remain fairly low. Therefore, your liver can actually turn the excess acetyl-CoA that's made, your liver can turn it into ketone bodies. And ketone bodies are significant, not because they can be used by the cell for energy, but the brain can either run on glucose or the, the ketone bodies. So ketone bodies are used by the brain for energy. That's why when someone is on a ketogenic diet, for the first couple of days, they're going to feel miserable as their body works on, um, on, 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 on producing the ketone bodies. Because in the short term, your body is actually relying on uh, glycogen stores. And as soon as the, the ketone bodies are made in adequate amounts, it's going to go to the brain and your brain can use it for energy. And that's why many people report once they enter ketosis, how they feel very alert and have a great feeling of well-being. It's mainly because after a period of three or four days, their brain suddenly has, has enough um, uh, energy to run. And of course, it's a very good feeling. What about when their breath um, like smells? You are actually smelling acetone. Oh. Yeah, so... One other sign of ketosis is strange smelling breath. Uh, some people have called it very metallic. Others have called it fruity. I don't know if I'd use fruity as the correct term, but uh, you know you've entered ketosis when your breath is funky, to put it nicely. Now, this is not to, to be mistaken for a condition called, called ketogenic acidosis. The problem with, with ketogenic acidosis is that your body has no ability to make insulin. So what happens is that, ironically, there's plenty of glucose in the bloodstream, but your cells that, that desperately need it, they do not have the ability to utilize it. So what happens is that all the tissues in your, your body begin to make energy via ketosis, via ketone bodies. And what happens is that the ketone bodies are acidic. So what happens is that it changes the pH of your, of your cells and it can cause tissue um, damage. And if it's untreated, then it can result in full-on failure of, 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 uh, of body organs. So ketoacidosis is, is a very dangerous state, but someone on a ketogenic diet will not enter um, ketoacidosis because they still have the ability to make insulin. And of course, there still is going to be some, some, some glucose floating around in the, in the body for a variety of chemical processes, but also because a true ketogenic diet does promote some intake of carbohydrates, under 25 a day, if I recall correctly. All right, so we have reached the end of the lecture. Are there any questions on anything we talked about? I know we talked about a lot today. I have a question about the glycolysis you just talked about. Sure. 
Um, I'm not really sure where you explained it, but I'm not, I'm not really sure what's going on in that little, little triangle right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so glycolysis, one molecule of glucose is taken in, and there's, I think there's eight steps where the glucose is eventually converted into two molecules of pyruvate. To give you an example, and there's a lot going on here. I've super simplified it. But glucose has the chemical equation of C6H12O6. And pyruvate has the chemical formula of C3H4O3. So more or less, the glucose molecule is split into two molecules of pyruvate. Okay, mama. Wait, wait, you have to wait. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. Hmm. I was talking to my daughter. Oh, <laughs> yeah. All right, so anyways, this one molecule of glucose is split into two smaller molecules of py pyruvate. And if, and if you look at it, it's basically half of uh, glucose. And then pyruvate is either going to enter fermentation or it's going to go to the mitochondria for oxidative phosphorylation. Does that kind of answer it? Yeah, but where does the glycerol come into play? Mm -hmm. Okay. So recall that there's like eight different steps of glycolysis. Glycerol can actually enter during one of those steps and substitute for one of the intermediaries. So glycerol can, can kind of sneak in there and eventually be converted into pyruvate. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? All right, so if you are in Thursday's lab, then uh, you are going to be taking the test exactly at seven o'clock. It is proctored by Proctorio, so make sure you are using the Chrome browser. And um, if you are in Thursday's lab, important you pay attention, we will be meeting back at 8.15 in this room. So I'm not going to close this chat. I'm just going to chat this uh, meeting. I'm just going to pause it. And then we will, we will meet back at 8.15 to talk about um, some things. Because you are going to have a case study assigned and it's going to be on Crohn's disease. So we're going to talk about Crohn's disease and also another update on COVID-19.